Hello everyone. I welcome you all to our fourth part of webinar series on orthotics and prosthetics. So so far we have seen upper limb, lower limb orthosis, and today we are going to look at the spinal orthosis. Spinal orthosis being very diverse in nature, we have divided it into two parts. So we will be so that we can cover it in more detail. So. No, <laughs> not in two parts. It is done. I have finished it in one part only. Okay, sorry, I wasn't going this. <coughs> okay, <coughs> again. Can I pause and cough if I have to, and then again restart? Yeah, this announce that you are not well. Please. <laughs> okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I welcome you all to our fourth part of the webinar series on orthotics and prosthetics. Uh, so, so far we have seen upper limb and lower limb orthosis and today we will be looking at spinal orthosis. Um, I would like to request our, I don't know what happened, so sorry. It's okay. Ah. Hello everyone, I welcome you all to our fourth part of the webinar series on orthotics and prosthetics. So far, we have seen upper limb and lower limb orthosis, and today we will be looking at spinal orthosis. Uh, I would request Dr. Bhakti Ma'am to take over the session. She, in spite of being not well, she is she is taking the efforts to teach us, and thank you for that. So, Ma'am, we are eager to learn from you. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prajakta. Uh... Please spare my voice today. I am down with a bad viral, but I'll try to just justify as good as possible like we've done for the earlier sessions. So today we'll be seeing the final part of orthosis, which is the spinal orthosis. Uh, so the benefits or the goals of spinal orthosis is mainly to provide spinal stability in stance, in sitting and in lying down position. Control the biomechanical alignment of the spine in locomotion when we are walking. It adds as an extra support to improve the alignment if there is anything wrong going on with the spinal alignment. Redistribute the pressures of the spine. Limit the excessive movements in the spine in case of any uh, post-operative procedure where we have to limit that particular movement like flexion or extension to promote healing, provide shock absorption and immobilization again to promote healing. So the major principle on which the spinal orthosis works is, uh, is these are just three brief principles. One is controlling the pain. It helps to control the pain by limiting the range of motion. So by limiting the range of motion, it helps helps to unload the pressures over the disc and the vertebra and the other spinal structures and thus limiting the pain. So the ne next uh, principle on which it works is basic stabilization. So what it does, it just adds an extra support to stabilize the weak or the injured structures of the spine and thus immobilizes the spine and promotes healing. And the third and the most important one is the three-point pressure system or it is also called as a three-point force system to provide the correction or prevent the progression of any deformity. For example, three-point pressure system we have have seen earlier also in our lower limb orthosis modules but I'll just explain you three-point pressure system is one force uh, is acting from one direction which is opposed by the two control actor forces to uh, fight to derive the correction at the spine this is nothing but a three-point force system so the types of uh, spinal orthosis are cervical orthosis Cervicothoracic orthosis, cervicothoracic lumbosacral orthosis, thoracic lumbosacral orthosis, and lumbosacral orthosis. We'll quickly see each one of these and their subtypes as much as possible. We'll try to cover uh, it in this module. So the first part is the cervical orthosis. It is the most simplest form of uh, orthosis in the spine. Uh, mainly the role of cervical orthosis is to stabilize the cervical spine and immobilize it in cases of stable or unstable fractures. So it can either be soft 
a collar it can be a semi rigid collar or a rigid collar depending upon the requirement of the patient so the first is the soft cervical collar it is also known as soft collar it is most popularly used for mild to moderate sprains for uh, providing immobilization mild immobilization and as a kinesthetic reminder to limit the range of motion it can also be used in kids to provide additional uh, correction if they do not have a good head control and for the maintenance of the position of the head semi rigid cervical orthosis it limits moderate a mild to moderate level of range of motion it also acts as a kinesthetic reminder in terms of mild to moderate sprains it helps to immobilize post surgery uh, for uh, promoting the healing so it comes in the anterior shell and the posterior shell which is attached to each other with a velcro strap it has an anterior opening for tracheostomy which helps in immobilize organization post cervical uh, surgeries the examples of these are philadelphia collar miami j collar and the malibu collar all three of these collars are semi rigid cervical orthosis A rigid cervical orthosis these are mostly Uh, fabricated according to the custom need to provide more rigid support to the cervical spine so it can either be used post surgical uh, procedure to add uh, an extra support to the cervical spine and limit the flexion and extension completely or it can also be used pre operatively in uh, the conditions of high inflammatory condition of the cervical spine where we have to restrict the range of motion to promote healing and reduce the inflammation over the spine so you can see in this picture is this is the posterior part uh, which was prefabricated for one of the uh, kid with a tumor in the cervical spine so it was it had a additional extra rigid support from behind with then additional a uh, chin support with uh, the anterior support so it was a rigid thermoplastic brace made to limit the entire flexion and extension range and promote healing next is a torticollis collar which is also called as a tort collar it is most effectively used for the management of congenital muscular torticollis it helps is in the positioning of the neck giving more balanced posture so it comes with a pvc molded a uh, tube it it is a moldable tube it comes with different attachments which are called as struts or the stents and it are they are connected with each other through a connecting strap so i'll quick quickly tell you the fitment of the tort collar is it has a a component and a b component so the a component of a tube goes from behind the head uh, uh, so the guiding uh, muscle is the trapezius muscle a component goes behind the head from the trapezius muscle and the b component goes below the mastoid process behind the ear we have to make sure that we do not put an extra pressure on the jaw line and then the studs are attached uh, from they are started they start from a shorter studs and we can increase them with a longer ones till we achieve a good correction that is correction of the lateral bending to one side so it acts as a it acts on the phenomenon of adding an extra stimulus and maintaining the position of the head in terms of mild torticollis in kids next is the headmaster collar uh, it is a positioning collar which can be used in adults as well as kids who have weak head control uh, it can be used in various uh, conditions such as uh, als multiple sclerosis arthritic patients or even in the cerebral palsy kids who have a weak head control so it is a comfortable brace with an anterior and the posterior anterior and the posterior component to control the head comfortably in one position next is cervical thoracic orthosis a uh, cervical thoracic orthosis has an extension till thoracic region and it provides motion restriction from c5 to c7 level of the spine it is most commonly used for immobilization in cases of stable cervical fractures or minimum unstable fractures 
uh, also can be used in moderate severe sprains moderate to severe sprains it helps to limit flexion better than extension uh, examples of these are sterno occipital mandibular immobilizer which is popularly called as a somi brace minerva brace and a halo orthosis so we'll see the somi brace first somi brace is a three poster cervico thoracic orthosis it has an anterior chest plate two padded shoulder straps which are attached to which are attached to another straps which cross over the interscapular region uh, of the scapula posteriorly and attach in front to the chest plate it has three different attachments uprights one upright is for the mandibular position and the other two uprights are for the occipital supports and a removable chin piece so these are briefly the parts of the somi brace it is ideal for bedridden patients because it does not have anything posteriorly so even if the patient is bedridden and we need uh, the stabilization from c5 to c uh, c uh, from c1 to c7 level of the vertebras it is possible it controls the flexion at c1 and c3 segments very effectively so the cervical flexion extension with somi brace is limited by 70 to 75% lateral bending is limited by 35% and the rotation is limited by 60 to 65% so the indication is again immobilization post operatively for unstable fractures as i told you and moderate to severe sprains next is a halo cervical uh, traction bracing so it is mostly a medical uh, device which is which which immobilizes the cervical spine post operatively for unstable spinal fractures so most commonly it is used for only immobilization post unstable fractures it provides highest level of range of motion restriction it consists of a metal ring with four metal straps and four metal uprights which which are attached to the plastic waste which is worn continuously so it provides 90 to 95% of range of motion control it provides a distraction force which reduces the pressure over the cervical spine and thus uh, lead to a good stabilization next is cervico thoracic lumbosacral orthosis so it comes in a two parts it has an uh, upper part which consists of the chin and the neck support and the other part is of the entire spinal support it can be extended to the pelvis it is attached to a clamp shell with each other so both the parts are attached to each other by a clamp shell and depending upon the requirement the level of the spine can be considered so it can either be extended till the pelvis it can just have uh, or it can be just till the lumbosacral region again it is used for immobilization post operatively or in unstable fractures to promote healing uh, the one of the type of the cervico thoracic lumbosacral orthosis is a milwaukee brace it was used traditionally for the management of idiopathic scoliosis so it consisted of a neck ring uh, three uprights one upright going anteriorly over the rib space the other two uprights going posteriorly through the thoracic region and then consisted of a pelvic corset uh, it is no longer used uh, that uh, it it is not that much used nowadays for scoliosis correction but yes it is a form of one cervical thoracic lumbosacral orthosis next is the thoracic lumbosacral orthosis again it can be semi rigid or rigid depending upon the requirement of the patient it helps to limit the range of motion of the thoracic and the lumbosacral segment of the spine it can be used in cases of stable fractures post operative immobilization mild to moderate sprains or strains in spinal deformities or other degenerative conditions of the spine such as spondylolisthesis or spondylitis uh, it is most commonly referred as a tco which is also called as total contact orthosis uh, we'll see the types of uh, we'll see the types of uh, tlso 
So uh, the most commonly used type is a tailor's brace. It can either be a short type or a long type. It supports the thoracic and the lumbosacral region, giving mild to moderate immobilization to the spine and holding it into a neutral position, yet permitting certain body movements for the daily activities. So most commonly it is used post-operatively to limit the excessive movement of the spine and promote healing. It can also be used used in mild to moderate sprains, degenerative spinal conditions, osteoarthritis and osteoporosis to provide additional support to the spine and thus uh, make effect, uh, thus uh, improve the quality of life of the patient to improve the activity and the function level thereby reducing the pain. So in Taylor's brace, there is one more type, which is called as a Taylor's night brace. It is exactly same as Taylor's brace, but it just has two lateral uprights from the lateral sides of the spine, which limits the lateral bending and the rotations of the spine. So it is just a, a modified version of a Taylor's brace. Uh, next is the cruciform anterior spinal hyperextension brace, also called as a cash brace. Again, it works on a three-point pressure system. It restricts the spinal flexion and thus stabilizes the spine in a neutral position. It helps to control and support the, uh, support the posture of the spine, reducing the pain and thus preventing the further injury and promote healing. So it can be used in a kyphotic postures in osteoporosis, in anterior compression fractures to provide immobilization and promote healing and also in in degenerative spinal conditions. It can also be given in post-operative cases where immobilization is required to limit the flexion of the spine. Next is a scoliosis brace. Uh, it is scoliosis brace is mostly custom fabricated brace. It is used to treat a uh, flexible scoliosis and kyphoscoliosis in adolescents. The goal is to prevent the progression of the scoliosis. Uh, these are the most commonly prescribed one is a Boston brace, but there are other forms of scoliosis braces available as well, such as Wilmington brace, Charleston's bending brace, which is used for night bracing. We'll see one of each types. Uh, so the indication for a scoliosis brace is the curve has to be in a moderate size. That is the corpse angle between 20 to 40 degrees. Then uh, I, or else it has to be a small curve, which is uh, progressing to more than five degrees or a curve that is over 30 degrees, which is first diagnosed, but a lot of growth period is left for a child to grow so that we can achieve that level of correction. So normally to say grossly, uh, using bracing 20 to 40 degrees of angle correction is possible with bracing and uh, physiotherapy, of course. So uh, uh, when prescribing a Boston brace, uh, there are three terminologies which are taken into consideration depending upon the severity of the curve and the location where the curve is present. So type one is the Boston lumbar brace. Type two is Boston thoracolumbar brace. Type three is Boston thoracic brace. Type four is Boston thoracic brace with hypokyphosis modification. So in Boston lumbar brace, the highest component is the lumbar pad. So it starts at so it starts at the lumbar curves, the where the apex is below L1. So it is most commonly used where we have lumbosacral curve. So it requires a trochanter pad and a lumbar pad for adding the extra pressure to achieve the correction. In Boston thoracolumbar brace, the highest uh, component is the lower thoracic region where the apex can be at the level of T12 or L1, or it can be at a lower thoracic curves where the apex of the curvature could be at T10 or T11 region. It also has a trochanter extension pad, the lumbar pad and a lower thoracic pad to add pressures accordingly. Boston thoracic brace. So here it has a thoracic 
uh, component with an extension to the axillary region. So here the apex can be up to T6 uh, region. So it can be used also in terms of the thoracic curves or in case of double curves, which can have thoracic and a lumbosacral curve. It usually requires again a trochanter extension pad, the lumbar pad, the lower thoracic pad and the axillary extension pad in order to give pressures for the spine to promote or prevent the correction. Boston thoracic brace with hypokyphosis modification is same as the thoracic brace. It just has the additional posterior extension, which is also called as a rabbit ear. Uh, it is prescribed when there is kyphoscoliosis. So scoliosis associated with kyphosis of the thoracic region. It has, uh, it is useful, it is useful in a se in severe cases of hypokyphosis or thoracic lordosis. The other one is a Charleston bending brace. Uh, this brace is most commonly used for night bracing to add additional uh, forces lateral forces and lateral forces to push the curve towards more midline. It adds more pressures over the curvatures and puts the spine into the overcorrected position. That is the reason it is to be worn in only in a supine or a lying down position and not while the patient is moving as it applies more of uh, more overcorrected pressures to the spine. And that is the reason it is used mostly during the night time. Last is the lumbosacral orthosis. It is nothing but a simple uh, LS belt or the LS corset. Again, it can be semi-rigid or rigid. Normally, it is referred as a chair back, uh, chair back brace. Uh, it helps to prevent trunk extension and provides additional stability to the trunk. Most commonly used in the cases of low back pain, degenerative spinal conditions or disc pathologies, mild to moderate sprains of lumbosacral region. Thank you. Wonderful. As always, ma'am, <laughs> you never fail to uh, So, yeah, it was amazing. And thank you so much for this helpful information. Um, so, we have one question about the these orthosis. Like, there is always a dilemma about the how long these coyotic correction braces should be a patient be using. So what is your opinion about it? Uh, so see, scoliosis correction braces, I'll tell you briefly. So if uh, it depends upon the Cobb's angle, actually. So if the angle is between one to nine degrees, then it is always considered as mild, uh, very minor scoliosis, which has very less asymmetry and no bracing is required. But from 10 degrees or 20 degrees to 40 degrees is from mild to severe scoliosis, where bracing can be considered as one of the option to prevent the progression of the deformity along with physiotherapy. So the duration again depends upon the severity of the curve and whether and the age of the child. So for example, if it is 10 to 50, if it is 15 to 20 degree of the Cobb's angle with a very minor asymmetry, then only sick, on, only a small brief period of brace using can be effective. But if the same angle is at the age of 16 or 17, then we probably need a more deeper period of bracing required because the structural growth is coming to end. So again, uh, in short, it depends upon the severity of the uh, angle of the deformity and the age of the child. But moreover, uh, I believe in a, uh, in a phenomenon that I always prescribe a brace and ask them to do the x-ray every six months to check whether the brace is helping it if the angles are correct, if the pressures given by the Boston brace or any scoliosis brace are enough or if any correction is to be needed. So six monthly follow-up, I think is a fair enough period. And then determine on that basis, we can determine 
determine how long should be uh, the time for which the brace is to be used again a dis again a good uh, discussion with the operating uh, consultant the orthopedic consultant and a treating physiotherapist is uh, always a good idea to decide the conjoint period of the brace use i guess so this is about the duration for which like months and weeks yes yes so it can vary from months to years okay. depending upon the severity of the deformity so within a day how long one should be using the brace like it is uh, they say that 23 to 24 hours so you should be wearing that so uh so normally uh, as uh, uh, i have mentioned that if it is a posturing brace or a brace that is to be worn during the day time i normally ask the patients to start wearing it for 3 to 4 hours a day and then gradually increase the time up to 9 to 10 hours uh if they are in lying down position when the spine is resting it is fine if the brace is not worn but during sitting standing and moving activity the brace is to be worn gradually for the maximum period of time and separate braces can be given for night splinting if we feel the severity of deformity is a lot and we need vigorous bracing for the correction okay okay so uh, there's another question that how in the osteoporotic condition how these braces are going to help what is the mechanism behind it so uh, in uh, as i have discussed in i think the principles of the spinal orthosis so we know that in osteoporosis the, there is weakening of the bones because of which the spinal stability is reduced they are more prone to have uh, the fractures or the, the collapsed vertebral fractures are more prone in osteoporosis so in that case if we provide an additional stability to the spine which will rem- limit the excessive movement of flexion or extension and it will also act as a kinesthetic reminder to the patient and support the weaker structure weaker bones to give an additional stability so uh, two principles would work for osteoporosis one is limiting the motion to reduce the pain and providing additional stability to support the weak bones so that's how we can enhance the function of the patient with these bracing okay. uh, and are there any Uh, specifically sir sacral braces uh, which are available only sacral, uh, sacral or ortho- uh, only sacral orthosis actually sacral orthosis involves only one or two things which actually i have not mentioned in this uh, these are just the sacral pillows or a, co- uh, a coccyx pillows so these are just externally applied pillows or a donut which we call as in coccydynia so it these are just externally applied braces uh, or we can say are uh, just uh, adjunct braces which will help to relieve this pain and pressure pressures over the sacral region uh, otherwise if in particularly in a few cases if we have to get anything fabricated uh, particularly for that uh, uh, sacral region can be done but most commonly used are the sacral pillows that's it okay that's it for today thank you sir okay thank you so much ma'am so here we are concluding the orthotic series and we will be continuing ahead with the prosthetic series but uh, thank you so much once again in spite of not being well you have taken this session taken this time out to gather all these information for us and we are really thankful to you because this is a lot of information to gather about this field and it clearly <coughs> your expertise in this field how you have developed it so thank you once again and so much i have tried to cover maximum i could in spinal orthosis actually it itself is a very very vast topic so uh, maybe in future if in respect to particular uh, brace or particular condition if we have to take uh, the bracing we can probably take it little more deeper if there are any questions related to that otherwise to uh, uh, to brief it in short i think this much uh was the overview of spinal orthosis otherwise there is a lot in depth of it which we can probably cover if uh, we have certain queries on it okay 
and yes we our site is open for all the queries so the our viewers can ask us questions any time and we will again torture you you with the questions <laughs> okay definitely thank you thank you so okay. much thank you so much and thank you uh, physio tv for this lead session once again thank you